Well, thank you so much. We appreciate the fact that you were willing to adapt to some new songs and so forth this morning. I know mean, that's not always the wisest thing to do, but I think the message of the songs that we sang together was so special and important for what we want to chat together about this morning just for a few moments. And as we do that, I would like to invite you, or if you prepare to do that, to invite you to pray with me. Lord, we give you these moments together on this Christmas Eve Sunday. We've been singing about your presence. You came into the world. But you are here, as we just sang, already, now, in your exalted state, you poured out your spirit to be among us. And we just pray that you take these moments and sanctify them to you. Will you be exalted in our midst? May you be praised, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You know, we've been contemplating together the story of redemption. We noted together, first of all, that it's a heavenly story told by angels. That's part of what makes it so amazing. God would send his own messengers to declare this story to us. It's a heavenly story. But it's told to people who are needy, people who are broken, who are sinful. That's another thing we noted together. From the very beginning, the cradle, to the end, <laughs> in the culmination, when Jesus returns in glory, it's sinful, needy people who get to hear this wonderful good news. And of course, that's the content of it, isn't it? It is good news for people who are needy. This morning, on this Christmas Eve Sunday, I want us to note a final thing about this story. And that is even more wonderful. Because ultimately, this story is about the glory of God. In every part of it, we are wonderful beneficiaries of it. But at the end of the day, this story is about the glory of God himself. And I hope as we think about that together and work our way through this story, you'll see why that is so important. To speak of the glory of God, of course, is to point to the amazing wonder of God's person and work. It's to lift up, if you will, the fame of God. And that's exactly what this love story demonstrates. And it's truly significant because God is committed to his glory being displayed throughout the universe. Listen to that again. God is committed to his glory being displayed throughout the universe. Isn't that what Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Jesus taught us to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name be glorified throughout the world. That is to esteem, to admire, to respect, to cherish, to honor, to praise his name. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we read that God acts in the interest of proclaiming and protecting his name in the world. Redemption is about the glory of God, therefore, being displayed in the world. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm chapter 25, verse 1. Psalm 25, verse 1. And we're just going to hear him as he talks about why God should act. Vindicate, I'm sorry, 25. Um, In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over you. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without a cause. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. Uh, and then in verse 11, for the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it's great. Do you get it? I trust in you. For the sake of your name, redeem me. Forgive my iniquity. Or again, in Psalm 79, the psalmist says something very similar as he speaks 
of, of God acting on behalf of his people. Verse 9, help us, God, our Savior. Why? Because we're in need? Well, we are. But is that the reason the psalmist cites? No. Help us, God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. And then listen, deliver and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. Isn't that amazing? Striking as we think about this? And in other places in, this, in the prophets, we read the same thing. So when we come to this greatest of all redemption stories, the cradle, the cross, and the crown, we realize that what is primary here is the glory of God. Now, let's look at how that's brought out in the storyline just really briefly this morning at the cradle. Isn't it amazing that after bringing the news of the Savior, when the angel messenger is joined by the host of heaven, what is it that they sing? Well, we've been singing it here, right? Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. The news of the Savior is reason for God's glory to be declared in all of the world. That's what occasions the praise of the angelic host. God's salvation through the coming of a child is what makes God truly amazing, truly wondrous in every way. But we go on and we note, of course, that the shepherds too what do they do? They, they hear the news from the angel and they decide they are going to go into, the, into Bethlehem and see these things which the angel has reported. And they come and they witness there, don't they? The baby with his parents there in that manger situation. And then what do they do? They go away and they're all sad and indifferent to the whole story. Is that what the text tells us? No. What do they do? They go away glorifying God and telling everyone, they see. you see what's going on here, folks? When this news is understood, when this news is comprehended, the first thing you have to do is glorify God. You see, what God does in redemption that we celebrate, inaugurated at this Christmas season, is so amazing that it causes people to glorify God. A little later on in the story in Luke chapter 2, the, Joseph and Mary bring the little child into the uh, temple to do the rituals that are connected with the birth of the baby. And Simeon is there, that old man who scripture tells us has been waiting on God's salvation. And he takes the child into his arms and he too bursts out in worship doesn't he, as he sees the child. And he describes this child as the glory of, the, of your people Israel. What does he mean by that? Is it simply that this child will make Israel famous? You know, we talk about that sometimes, don't we? If we think of a great person coming from a particular town or city, those of us who are Canadiana from the past, will remember a famous hockey player whose name was Bobby Orr. Every once in a while, his name still comes up as one of the greatest defensive players of the league. Uh, if you're younger, you may not know that name, but us old-timers do. And he came from a little town not far from where I grew up. And that little town was called Perry, Perry Sound. Maybe some of you know where it is, up north. But anyway, Bobby Orr is said to be the, the pride, isn't he? The pride of Perry Sound. Or more currently, there's a famous hockey player who still is an elite player whose name is Sidney Crosby. Maybe you've heard that name around. And he too comes from a little town, not far from where Ralph grew up, a place called Cole Harbor. You know, we would say of Sidney Crosby that he is the pride of Cole Harbor. But my friends, that's not what we're talking about here. When we talk about Jesus being the glory of Israel. No, this one is the one in whom God's people will find pleasure. 
we'll find wonder and worship. That's what we're talking about here. When Simeon says of Jesus, he is the glory of your people, Israel. He is their admiration and wonder. Jesus speaking, of, or I'm sorry, John the Apostle writes in his gospel, speaking of the incarnate Christ, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in him we saw God's glory displayed. Did you hear that theme coming through in some of the songs we sang today? You see, the wonder of Christmas is that God reveals himself in his glory in that child who first came into the world. So the angels and Simeon and John and the shepherds declare that Jesus is the expression of the glory of God in this world. And in seeing him, God is honored as his people cannot help but worship him. That's the cradle. But what about the cross? I would say to you, if the cradle is a display of God's glory, how much more is the cross on occasion that give us the greatest insight into the very heart and person of God himself? Jesus himself said that he came to reveal the Father's glory. In a conversation with people given to us in John chapter 12, Jesus said that he came to this very hour referring to the imminent death that he would suffer on the cross and then said, Father, glorify your name. You know, there was a voice from heaven when the Father said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it. God, you see, was honoring, was making his name famous through the redemption that he provided at Calvary in his son, Jesus. Do you know there is no other event, no other moment in all of history when the fullness of God is disclosed so powerfully as at the cross. On the one hand, it shows us the absolute holiness of God, doesn't it? Who cannot abide sin and has committed himself to eradicate sin from his world. It was an intruder from the beginning, and God intends to reclaim his own property, his world from sin. So the soul that sins must die, Scripture tells us. The wages of sin is truly death, and every person who has ever lived stands guilty before God, the holy God of sinning against his glory and his person. God must deal with sin because his world is a world where only righteousness can dwell. That's one hand. On the other hand, God's heart is that of love. As Exodus 34 says, when God reveals his character and person to Moses, I am the Lord. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, I do not leave the guilty unpunished. He does punish the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation, as God declared there to Moses. So listen then, in order to satisfy his holiness, he himself bore the punishment of death our sin deserved. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life, his life for us. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. So here it is. At the cross, the holiness of God is satisfied by the love of God, who himself bears our punishment that our sin deserved. Brothers and sisters, friends today, this is the glory of God revealed. I like the way pastor and theologian John Piper spells out its implications. 
He says, so whether we are reading the Old Testament or the New Testament, the great ground of our forgiveness is God's allegiance to his holy name and the unswerving pleasure that he takes in making the worth and righteousness of that name known, <coughs> especially in the gospel message that Christ died both to justify the ungodly and to vindicate the Father's justice. Do you see it? Tied to this finished work is the resurrection and ascension. And Jesus has received through that event, Scripture tells us, the name that is above every name. He's been exalted to the right hand of God. We saw that again in the songs we sang this morning. He is both Lord and Christ, declared to be so by the Father himself. And, Scripture says, therefore, at his name, every knee shall bow. He will receive glory from everyone in the cosmos. No wonder Paul could say in Romans 1 that the resurrection is the announcement that Jesus is the Son of God in a powerful way. It is, if you will, the coming out in one sense of the King of Kings. The cross and the resurrection attest to and witness to the glory of God and moreover occasion the glorifying of God in the world. The cradle, the angels declare the glory of God. The cross, the revelation of the glory of God. And the crown at Jesus appearing he will come in great glory, Scripture says. Jesus said that he would come in his Father's glory with his angels. Or again, that he would come with power and great glory. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, his renown will reverberate throughout the cosmos. First, because of who he's revealed to be. When every eye see him and all who who pierced him even will see that he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You know, we were talking about this at the beginning of the service and just commented, how is it, how often we see this in Jesus, uh, the narratives of Jesus in the Gospels, where there is Jesus, their Savior before them. He is showing his grace to people's lives. And yet the tragedy of it is that those who were the benefactors of his grace and love could not see that this one was Lord of all. See, one day every eye, you won't mistake it, he's coming again and every eye will see that he is Lord. But also, not just because of who he is, but also because of what he's done in transforming sinners like us into saints. Paul makes us just this point, doesn't he? In him, he says in Ephesians chapter 2, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything out in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be through the praise of his glory. Do you see it? We are going to be the reason that God is glorified. The saints will be part of his entourage when he returns. That will be the declaration of how great he really is. So we already observe that the day is coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's coming, folks. This love story is to bring glory to God because he is the central player. In Revelation chapter 4, there's a picture of the heavenly environment and there's a throne in the middle of that, that picture. It's the throne of God. And all around it are living creatures giving glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne. And, and there's a group of leaders there called the elders and they have crowns on. And you know what they do with their crowns? They take them off and they cast them at the feet of the one who sits upon the throne. Why? 
because in all of this, God is preeminent. He is committed to make his name glorious. And he will do that by redeeming his people. And brothers and sisters, that's why it's with confidence that we proclaim the gospel to you today. God is at work changing the lives. God is at work making you new creatures and in the process bringing glory to his name. There's a story told of a young boy who went to uh, see a great pianist who was at a great concert whose name was Paderewski. We enjoyed Seth's playing for us and, and just this week I saw a little video, just this weekend, a little video of a little girl playing in a recital too, you know. And it made me think again of this story. And, and this lady took her son to see this great pianist and they found their seats in the great concert hall and, and the mother looked around and she saw a friend of hers so she just left her son in the seat and ran over to say hi before the concert started. And uh, when uh, seizing, as I said, she... Uh, but the little boy saw it as an opportunity too and he was enthralled by this big building. You know. So he got up from his seat and he began to wander up into the area of the stage and went through a door that said, no admittance. And when the mother came back, when the house lights dimmed to get ready to start the concert, she didn't find her son there at all. He wasn't there. So of course, she was in a frenzy. And then the stage curtains pulled back. And there was her little son sitting at the grand Steinway that was in the middle of the stage. And he'd be plick, plucking the, the notes of twinkle, twinkle, little star. Well, you can imagine how embarrassed and totally humiliated that mother was by her son up there. But then, from the stage wing, came the great Pawlowski. And he walked over to the piano. And he whispered in the ear of that child. And the child continued to play. And he put his left hand onto the bass section and he began to play the bass notes and a whole series of things. Then he reached around to the other side and he covered the upper echelons of the treble, of the treble section as well, playing the obligados and all of those kinds of things that took that little simple theme and elevated it to a wonderful, wonderful concerto. You see, in that moment, that little child's poor efforts were elevated to the greatest heights by the work of the Master. Whose glory was in all of that? It was the work of the Master, wasn't it? Oh yes, that child got to share in the glory. But if it hadn't been the work of the Master, there would have been no grand moment in anybody's life. My friends, in some small way, that's what God is doing. He came the cradle, the cross, and the cradle. And he took broken people, needy people, incapable people, and he's begun the work of creating them into the image of his glorious Son, through that work, to, to the praise of his glory. And so this Christmas season, we're here to worship as well. Come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And that's at the heart of who we are as Christians. And this season, and all through the year, Scripture reminds us, so, come and worship. Not just as we gather on Sunday mornings, but whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Well, my friends, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you haven't embraced his work in your life, then you are still a broken piece, a sinner in rebellion against God. The work of the cradle, the cross, and the crown is to call you into a life of relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. To take your life and to make of you a glorious piece of workmanship to his praise and glory. 
that's what he wants to do. And so the invitation of Christmas, the invitation of Easter, the invitation of the ultimate culmination of Jesus Christ, friends, come and worship Christ the King. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for this time together as we reminded ourselves of the Christmas narrative. It's not just about a child in a manger. It's about a king on his throne and his glory that will be declared forever and ever. Will you make each one of us to be participants in this wonderful story to the praise of your glory and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name.